Hello, once again, it's your boy. Uh, your boy, the cop. I was given this book. I think y'all should check it out. The things that I got from it. From the person who gave it to me. Um, it's something that we we all should take a chance to read. It's about rice, punishment, and the afterlife of mass incarceration. And, um, today's Deadly Bread is about that very subject. Mass incarceration. I, I worked, I had a job at, people know I played sports my whole life. I really never really had a job for real, for real. But, it was like from fifth grade to my injury, all I did was play sports. Like, so, was, you know, I got a scholarship to college, really didn't have to pay for nothing there. Uh, I could have went anywhere I went to. I chose California because I've never been there. It was a beautiful time. It was a great experience. But uh, I made some mistakes in my life also. And, uh, you know, I'm not one of the people who be pump faking. Like, my record showed that I was definitely in the mix. And the worst thing you could do when you're in the mix is be good at it. And I was really good. But because of those mistakes... Life, if it was not for my talent or gift, then I could see why it would be basically almost impossible for me to make enough money to live in this time of inflation and everything that's going on with the prices of food, gas, homes, shelter, natural resources. All these things are sky high. At a time where we need help, not burdens. And I'm talking about all Americans, not just black, white people. I'm talking about all Americans. Like, this COVID has crippled our way of life. But I had a job at Walmart, and it was just something I was doing. I was bored. And I got the job instantly. Like my first interview, they was like, oh man, we got to put you somewhere. Your resume crazy. You own most of your stuff. Like what What made you want to work here? And I explained it to them. And uh, I had my vest and my name tag. <laughs> Everything. And then on, on the loudspeaker, it said, this is my second day. On the loudspeaker, it said, I'm talking about early in my second day, too. I might have only been in there for like 30 minutes. And they put me in the office and they told me, uh, Mr. Washington. <laughs> and it was security in there. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? I know I ain't take nothing. So he was like, uh, I'm sorry. I have nothing to do with this. I tried to fight for you. But, and he handed me some paper that was stapled together. And it had every time I had police contact on it. And it was staple. It was like three sheets. And I'm like, sir, look, I didn't get found guilty for half of the stuff. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. But he said, it's police contact, not convictions. I'm like, damn, this is rigged. So it's like, take off your vest and, you know, into your locker. And we don't want to talk about that. What makes you think that? I'm going to, what is it about me that makes you think that I'm going to start trouble because you said y'all hire felons, but I guess not my felonies. He said it came from the corporate office. I mean, nothing he could do about it. He fought for me. I, whether that was true or not, at least he gave me enough respect to lie, you know. And I left. I was working in 
at Hanneman Hospital before they closed it down. Right at Broad Race. And one of my OGs, white dude named Dr. Bach, wear rollies and shit. You know, you see him coming in there with his day off. <laughs> Yeah, had some cool black shit on. I'm like, okay, he must got a black girlfriend or something. And he pulled me in his office one day and he said, listen, I ain't gonna let this go no further than, than me, but like, you, you're not supposed to be, you never were supposed to go to the school to be an RN with a record like this. They never would hire you anywhere. And the reason I love that boy because he told me I don't care what your record say. I know you as a person. You bust your behind. You do stuff you ain't supposed to do. You don't complain. If I need you, you're there. So this is just between me and you. Now you notice I said two different stories. One had a good ending. And the other one had a bad ending. But it was all from mass incarceration. And the rules that people make. When you go apply for a job, you have to understand that your whole entire police contact, that means when you got pulled over and they thought you were drunk, made you come outside. I mean, when you was 19 years old, you stole something out of the store. I mean, whatever police contact, it does not matter whether you get found guilty or not guilty. Anything that's involved in the police will come up. If you think that is fair, That a person can be discriminated against because of his track record. Regardless of whether he was taken in front of the court, got found not guilty, nothing. Just because it happened. Then you need to read this book. If you don't understand that, why do they build jails? And they don't have any inmates because they are already putting in a system systematically that will develop inmates to fill that prison. Philadelphia has the highest per capita, meaning the highest ratio between people in jail and people in the street in the United States of America. At any given time, there's 7,000 inmates on state road to the point where COVID started they had to start letting people go who had petty crimes and had low bells because they didn't have any room and this has been happening year after year they always get full so much they start letting petty criminals go so they let the petty criminals go because they know it's a revolving door they're going to be right back So, so what is my point? My point is you can complain about the trap all day long, but keep walking into it. Or you can complain about the trap, realize it's a trap, and walk around the trap. I make a nice living for myself, but I can make 50 times more money if I walked into the trap. It's called trapping for a reason. Uh, why nobody get that, I don't understand. But to make light of it, I just ask you the question. Can, is there someone out there whose family has not been directly impacted by mass incarceration? I, I don't know one. I don't, I don't know one. When you take the father out of the home, They already know what's going to happen. But one thing I try to do now, I try to keep my word, and it was time for me to do my uh, my daily bread. And that's what I felt like talking about because, like, I've, I've wrestled with myself, and I don't want nobody to think that they the only ones who do it. I wrestle with myself daily. Like... 
a person might say, oh man, you 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 good, man. You look where you live at, look what you doing. And it's like, yo. It seems like the more I climb up the ladder, the more is required. So it's like you know. It's just the thought in the back of my head. I don't want no one to think that they're by themselves. I had those same urges, those same inclinations, those same desires, that same dumb conversation. Well, maybe if I just do it a couple times and just get my bread up and then, you know, but... Trap. <laughs> I have to keep reminding myself, so this is for me just like it's for somebody else. Just to remind myself that I have peace of mind. I have people around me who care about me. I don't need for anything. So why am I so unsatisfied? So once again, it's your boy DiCapo, like always. You are beautiful, you are special, you deserve to be happy. If you find yourself in a miserable state and you do not remove yourself from that which makes you miserable, then you are no longer a victim, you are a participant. DiCapo 1.